Okay, welcome back everybody. So in the previous two videos, we spoke about specific methods that we can use to solve differential equations. And in many of the videos that follow, we will also be looking at different and more complex methods. But what we're going to do in this video is again focus on the application. So one of the things that we do in this class is I throw a lot of differential equations up on the board and I give you no explanation of where they come from a lot of the time. So what I want to do with this lecture is I want to derive a differential equation and go through a number of word problems associated to it so you can kind of see or at least get a feel for another place where differential equations come up. Now the reason I say another place is because in the first video we derived the motion of a falling object from basic physical laws, right? Just from really looking at a free body diagram. So this one will be slightly more complex and therefore it'll be slightly more interesting. Here's the basic idea, okay? I've got a tank and this tank is filled with salt water. So let's say I've got some amount of water in this thing. So this is my water. I have uh, 100 gallons in here. So 100 gallons. We're going to use the imperial system for this. Um, and let's put a couple notes. So the first thing that we have is that water will be draining out of the bottom of this from, say, a little spout. So I have some water coming out. And similarly, water will be dumped into this thing by a little stout or spout. Now, pardon my drawing. I hope that this sort of gets the general idea for uh, to us. But let's put up some notes here, okay? So the first thing is that at time zero, uh, the tank contains, let's call it Q naught pounds LB of salt dissolved in 100 gallons of water. Okay? So inside of that tank, there's 100 gallons of water with Q0 or Q0 uh, pounds of salt that's dissolved into it. Okay? Now, second piece here. Water containing, so this one's going to be a lot of writing, right? It's going to be a sort of word problem. But water containing, uh, let's say, one quarter pounds per gallon of salt uh, is added at a rate of R uh, gallons per minute. Okay, so that is this piece right up here. So this is telling me that R gallons per minute is coming in, and it's got one quarter pounds per gallon of salt. Okay, so that's one more piece that we can fill into this. And the third thing that we can say about this is about the water going out. So there's a well-stirred mixture So I'll explain that in a moment. And it's draining out at the same rate, at R gallons per minute. Okay, so that means that water is coming out of this spout similarly at R gallons per minute. Okay, now what does it mean to be well stirred? That means that there's some going on, maybe a little turbine or something like that inside of the tank that is mixing up the salt so that we have a completely uniform distribution. So if you dip a cup in and you take out some of that salt water and I dip a cup in and also dip out some of that salt water, it's going to have the same amount of salt per gallon in it, right? So it's mixed up in such a way that there's not regions that are all sal or a lot more salt here and less salt there, okay? We're assuming a uniform mixing of the salt. All right, so how do we do this? How do we approach this problem? Well, what we want to do is we want to set up a differential equation. And that differential equation is going to be for the amount of salt inside of the tank. 
So let's say, let Q of T be the amount of salt. So the amount of salt uh, in the tank, so in the tank at time T. Okay? Now, what we would like to do is we'd like to set up an initial value problem. Now remember, initial value problem is composed of two different components. First of all, the problem component, that's the differential equation, and the initial value component. And luckily for us, we already know the initial value. It's right here. So we know that Q of zero is equal to Q naught. That's good. That makes our life slightly easier. The question is, how do we set up our differential equation that's going to be associated to this thing? Well, here is what we know. The rate of change of the amount of salt, okay? So the rate of change of the amount of salt is going to be the rate at which salt is coming in to this bucket minus the rate at which salt is going out. Okay, let's do a little bit of unit analysis first because this is the best way to figure out if we are in on the right track when we're trying to analyze this thing. Q is the amount of salt in the tank. It's going to be measured in pounds. That means that the derivative, which is a rate, a rate of change, this thing is in pounds per minute, right? T is going to be measured in minutes. That's because we've been given everything in terms of minutes. So the left-hand side of this equation is in the units pounds per minute. That means that the right-hand side also has to be in the units pounds per minute. And in particular, rate in and rate out independently have to be in terms of pounds per minute. Okay. Let's just take a look at something, okay? So for the rate in, we have R gallons per minute coming in, and of those gallons that are coming in, we have one quarter pounds per gallon uh, of that is salt. So what is the amount of salt that's coming in per minute? Well, let me just do, let's look at the units first, just to analyze these fractions. So we have gallons per minute coming in, and we have pounds per gallon of salt. That tells us that when we multiply these two things together, these things in these units, we get pounds per minute. Pounds per minute is exactly what we wanted. So that means that the rate in here is going to be, so rate in, uh, let's put it down here. Rate in is equal to, multiplying these two things together, R over 4. Okay. The rate out takes a little bit more uh, thinking. Well, the first thing that we know about this is that we have the same rate of water coming in as we have going out. Now, think about this uh, in a different way for a second. Imagine I've got a room full of people, and I tell you every single hour, one person leaves the room and one person enters the room. Well, then you would know that the number of people in the room never changes. The rate in is equal to the rate out. Same thing is happening here. Our gallons per minute is coming in, our gallons per minute is going out, you always have 100 gallons in this tank. You never lose the amount of water or you never gain an amount of water inside this tank. It's always 100 gallons. That tells you that if you have Q pounds of salt inside of this entire 100 gallons, then Q over 100 is salt per gallon, uh, sorry, pounds, pounds of salt per gallon. Okay, now I'm in a pounds per gallon situation and we know that it's going out at exactly the same rate. 
So now that I've got pounds per gallon, and I already knew that gallons per minute is the rate, all right, sorry, is R, this tells me that the rate out is equal to RQ over 100. Same principle over here. The only thing that I needed to know was how much, um, how many pounds per gallon of salt I have inside the tank. And that means that I can put everything together here and I can say that therefore the IVP, the initial value problem, is the following. Well, I've got DQ, DT, rate in minus rate out, R over four minus RQ over 100, rate in minus rate out, that's what we just derived here. Remember, I in IVP stands for initial, so our initial value is Q of zero is equal to Q naught. Nice, easy peasy, right? Now, what we have at our disposal is a way to actually solve this thing too, right? So let's go ahead and do it. So this differential equation, if I rewrite it, so let me write it as Q prime minus, uh, sorry, plus, once I pull this piece over, R over 100 Q is equal to R over four. Why did I write it like that? Because I want a light bulb to turn on in your head. And in particular, I want you to say, ah, that is a first order linear ordinary differential equation. And I know what to do with that type of equation because Jason told me two, uh, two lectures ago. What he told me was that I need to use an integrating factor. Okay, so let's do it. Our integrating factor, so integrating factor. Well, in our case, our P of T function is constant. So we remember how to do this. In this case, we called it A uh, two, uh, two videos ago. But in this case, it becomes E to the RT over 100. Okay, so then when you put that integrating factor into your equation, you multiply all three of these terms by mu of T, we know that by the choice of that integrating factor, I get E to the RT over 100 times Q, all taken with a derivative. Remember, that was the whole purpose of an integrating factor. The goal is to undo a product rule. This leaves me with R over 4 E to the RT over 100. Okay, now remember I gave you, uh, I called it, I said like in general the procedure is, and then it always whenever we got to this part I said just integrate and solve nothing left that's too complicated. So I'm going to go ahead and just put the solution up. Uh, in this case, integrate it up and then don't forget the, the constant here and divide off this term. And so therefore we get a general solution Q of T in this case, which is equal to 25 plus C E to the minus R T over 100. Beautiful, right? But we didn't quite solve it all. Notice that we have an initial condition as well. So also, so I'm just kind of putting it in here because there's not a whole lot left to talk about for this. But also, Q of zero is equal to Q naught gives, well, this is going to pin down a value of C so in this case, I get Q naught. When I put T equal to zero in here, I get Q of zero, which is Q naught. This becomes 25 plus C, E to the minus R times zero over 100. This whole thing becomes one. And that tells me that C is equal to Q naught minus 25. 
And so therefore, now I have a solution, a particular solution to my initial value problem, which is 25 plus Q naught minus 25 E to the minus RT over 100. Okay, before we conclude this video, I want to discuss what is going on with this solution, right? So there's some things that I can easily identify that are important for this equation. The first of which is this value 25 that sort of keeps coming up. What does 25 represent? Well, again, pause the video and see if you can figure it out for yourself. But if you didn't pause the video and you would like me to tell you, that 25 represents the equilibrium value of my differential equation. Look it. Remember, the equilibrium is when the derivative is equal to zero, dq by dt. That's equal to zero. I've got a linear equation that I need to solve for q, which you can very easily find q to be 25. So this is the equilibrium. So something that we talked about in the very first video is coming back. Then let's look at the other components of this differential equation, the part that's changing in time. What's happening here as time goes on? Well, as time goes to infinity, since we're going to assume, of course, that r is positive, this piece right here, this goes to zero as time goes to infinity. This piece is decaying, which means that the whole thing goes to zero as time goes to infinity. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it tells you that no matter how you start with Q naught, you always will settle into the equilibrium. That comes from the fact that this piece right here is decaying in time, it's disappearing, leaving you with just the equilibrium value. This should feel very, very, very familiar, right? Because this is the exact same thing that we saw happen uh, in the very first lecture with the motion of a falling object. Now, these are two physically very, very different scenarios, but if you go back and compare with the solution from the motion of the falling object, it's very, very, very similar. In fact, we saw again with that case that everything settles into the equilibrium. So even though we derived an equation for this sort of chemical problem, we got something that looked very similar. And we got to show off with a new shiny tool of the integrating factor. We got to see how that thing can work. If you want to solve this thing uh, as a separable equation, that's perfectly acceptable. You can do that as well. If you would like to see how to do that, just go back to the first lecture and take a look at what we did with the motion of the falling object.